grace to you and peace from God above us, God beside us, and God within us. Welcome to you who are online, as well as to those of you who are in this space. We continue this chant of prayer because today's theme is what does it mean to be more open and inclusive for the sake of the gospel? And this song invites you, and the imagery will invite you to see God everywhere, which means, therefore, we include everyone and everything in the goodness of God. Let us continue to sing our prayer. Let us pray. We see your face, O God, in the light of the moon and patterns of stars, in scarred mountain rifts and ancient groves and mighty seas and creatures of the deep. We see your face, O God, in the light of eyes we love in the salt of tears we have tasted, in weathered countenances east and west, in the soft skin glow of the child everywhere, in the eyes of those different from ourselves, we see your face, O God. Always and everyone around us, amen. Let us rise in body or in spirit for this hymn.
services. Great. Today, we are learning about a new part of the story. We've been following the story of Paul, and he meets someone called Timothy. You guys know anybody named Tim? Yeah, we were just talking about that this morning. Your dad's named Tim. Funny. So, he meets Tim, and we'll just call him Tim because he's young. He's not an old man like so many leaders in the church were. He, Timothy is young. And Paul says, wow, you know so much about faith. It's amazing. How did you learn about faith? And he finds out that Timothy learned about faith from his mom and his grandma. So I'm curious, who has taught you about faith? It might be your mom and grandma, just like Timothy. Anybody want to share? Who's taught you about faith in your life? You're pointing at me. Yes, uh, that, that's my job. <laughs> it's my job to teach people about faith, to teach you about faith. I bet that you all have at least one person that you can think of in your mind that's taught you something about faith. And just like Timothy, it could be your mom, it could be your grandma, it could be a dad, it could be a Sunday school teacher. Yeah, I am also your mom. Yes, that, that helps. You check two boxes there. Yeah, we all have people who teach us about faith. And even if you don't have someone in your family that you think, oh yeah, they teach me a lot about faith, maybe you have someone here at the church that does. A special Sunday school teacher, like teacher Vicki or teacher Zoe, teacher Emily. We have so many great teachers here that teach us about faith all the time. And when you grow up, if somebody asks you, who taught you about faith? You're going to have a really great answer for it, just like Timothy did. Paul and Timothy talk a lot about being young and learning. And Paul reminds Timothy not to let anyone look down on you because you're young. He says, be an example. Even if you're young, you can still be an example of faith. So Timothy's mom and grandma must have taught him a lot because he was, he was strong enough in his faith that he could set an example for everyone, even people who were older than him. Have you ever thought about being an example, not just for kids like you, but for people who are even older than you? That would be pretty amazing, huh? All of us here in this room, we can all be an example to others of what faith looks like, just in how we live our daily lives. An example for people who are younger, an example for people who are older. And no one should look down on you because of your age. I am sure glad that you guys are here to learn more about God this week, and I hope you get to talk with a special Sunday school teacher today as you learn more about God and how much God loves you and how you can live your faith every day. Can I pray for you before we go learn more about God? Let's pray. God, thank you for this amazing opportunity we get each and every week to teach children more about your love and who they've been called to be in this world. We pray that we would take that opportunity every week to express and set examples for how your love has changed our lives and how your love continues to change the world. In your name we pray, amen. Let's go. Please join me in prayer. Thank you for the people that have taught us the face of God, the love of God, the presence of God, the hands, the feet, the body, the warmth, the memories that we carry as we gather here, the things that we have learned, the things that we are unlearning, the things that we are reconstructing as we come to understand who you are and the meaning of faith that 
shapes and changes our lives. Whatever that journey has looked like, God, we come today with hope and gratitude for everything that has led us to this moment, this place, this community. And we pray that you would continue to open the open our hearts and open us to new understandings, new experiences of your love in our lives and in this world. And as we open these texts, both ancient and new, we pray that we might have your spirit to, of discernment to know what you are speaking to us today and to also be an example for later generations and those who are close to us of the face of God that is among us and within us, we pray. Amen. Our first reading is from a New Testament document called The Acts of the Apostles. Through this story, the writer tries to keep religious people open to the God who is always surprising us with new expressions of inclusiveness. So Acts chapter 11, verses 1 through 18. Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, why did you go to the uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain it to them step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, by no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time the voice answered from heaven, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times. Then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remember the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced. And they praised God saying, then... God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. Our second reading is from the Reverend Carlton Pearson, a bishop and evangelical leader of a Tulsa, Oklahoma megachurch and heir apparent to Oral Roberts' Hour of Power dynasty. Challenged by an encounter with God, the Reverend Pearson stopped believing in hell and in the exclusive claims of Christian 
fundamentalism. After his mind was open to what he now calls the gospel of inclusion, he wrote, any time that knowledge and a version of the truth are considered to be absolute, fundamentalism is the result, whether the arena is Christianity, Islam, Judaism, or any other religious faith, as well as atheism, conservative or liberal political views, even evolution or intelligent design. Anytime our minds are closed and there is no room for dissent, we are on a slippery slope towards stagnation. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Let us be still and listen to the whisper of the Spirit. This last week, I was with a group of about 20 of our older adults at Atria Covell Gardens Senior Living Center. The day before, I'd been with an equally large group of senior adults at uh, the Unit University Retirement Center. But on Wednesday, we read together in this Bible study that leads to communion this story from the book of Acts. And before I read the story to them, I asked them a couple questions. I said, can you remember a time when you changed your mind? Perhaps you can remember a time when you changed your mind. What caused you to change your mind, I asked them. What benefit came to you because you changed your mind? How hard was it or even painful was it for you to change your mind? There were a number of answers, none of them I'll divulge here. But what I recognized with both sets of these senior adults this week, and I said it to one of them, one group, that people who are in their 80s and 90s, and there are some who are in their hundreds, one of our members is 101 or 102, and still feisty and alert as anything, I said to them, you know, there is no other group of people on the face of the planet throughout history that have endured as much change as you have. You know how to change. And some of you in this space, online or here, are part of that age group. You know what it means to change. This story we have before us in the book of Acts is a story of change. A little background on it. It's our reading today from the revised common lectionary. The early Christian community is trying to live out the implications of Easter and of Pentecost. Pentecost, that day that comes 50 days after Easter, the full implications of what it means to live in the fullness of the Spirit and of the resurrected Christ. The problem is Peter has done something the Spirit prompted him to do that has gotten him into a little bit of trouble with the authorities. He baptized a Roman army officer and his household. Now, the Romans in Palestine were the oppressors. This Roman happened to be God-fearing, but he wasn't a Jew. And he was part of the oppressing, occupying army responsible for oppression, repression, and violence. People living in the local setting aren't necessarily thrilled to have them around, and Peter baptized his entire household. A little background in the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, the purpose of the, of the book really is to reconcile the ministries of Peter with the ministries of Paul. Paul, the evangelist to the Gentiles, Peter, who was the teacher to the Jewish Christian community. 
The Acts of the Apostles really wants to give us a vision for what it means to be inclusive, expansive, broad, that the gospel goes out into all the world, that all the world is full of the Spirit of Christ. The book challenges Old Testament rules about what kinds of food are clean or unclean, what kind of rituals need to be let go of in order for the gospel to thrive in a new culture. The book also reflects the division within early Christianity. The author wants to move the community away from ways that easily divide over what's traditionally right and wrong, who's good, who's bad, who's in, who's out. In Acts, the author argues that God has changed. God is not the parochial God of a certain group, its cultures, its traditions, its customs. God is the God of all, and the Spirit is always evolving human beings toward a better way of being human, into new expressions of goodness and beauty and justice. And often those expressions contradict undermine and challenge old conventional ways. The same problems emerge in the writings of Paul in his letters to the Corinthians. The church was dividing over Jewish customs and Greco-Roman customs. Each group was making their tradition, their culture, their behaviors normative for the rest, and so divisions began to alienate one from the other depending on who had particular power. We do this too, don't we? What are the, some, some of the ways we divide in our culture today? Hmm? What are some examples? Political parties? Where you live? Socioeconomics? Age? Right? Race? Masks, no masks, learning, education, uh, vax, no vax, pro-choice, pro-life, and the looming Supreme Court decision is fracturing America all over again. The laws aren't bad, customs aren't bad, traditions aren't wrong. But too often, we embrace them uncritically. We embrace these laws and these traditions and these cultures because they're part of our inherited identity, and then we therefore codify them as absolute. And then when somebody challenges them for us, what happens? We react inside, often unconsciously. We call that a trigger. We get activated because our identity our history is being challenged. Meanwhile, the Spirit of God is always inviting us to bigger and better things, a bigger and better way of being human on this planet and inviting us out of the confines of the superiority of the smaller and constricting assumptions, practices, and customs that we happen to identify with. The Spirit inspires us always toward more flexibility for the common good rather than rigidity for the good of a few. That's what today's story is all about. Peter has returned to the church headquarters in Jerusalem. For Presbyterians, we might say he's gone back to Louisville, to General Assembly, to answer for what he's done. He has to explain himself to the church board or the church council. They have criticized him for breaking the rules, for breaking Jewish customs. Why, Peter, did you go and eat with uncircumcised men? Peter then steps up to tell the story of his radical change of mind. He says, I was in Joppa, Seaport City, it was the hour of prayer, three o'clock in the afternoon. I went up on the roof and had a vision. In that vision, I saw a sheet lowered from heaven, and it was full of animals, unclean animals for Jews. And a voice said to me, Peter, get up, kill, and eat. And do you remember what Peter said? Mm-mm. 
no matter how hungry I am, nothing unclean, profane has ever crossed these Jewish lips. Second time, the vision happens. Same thing happens. A third time, the same thing happens, and Peter rejects it again. And this time, the voice says to Peter, Peter, what God has proclaimed clean, do not call profane. And at that moment, there is a at the door. Hmm, do you remember? There are men standing at the door sent by Cornelius, the Roman centurion, a Roman military officer, for Peter. The door opens, and Peter is staring the Roman oppressors in the eye. They say, Peter, the Roman military man whom we serve would like to speak with you. Can you imagine what Peter may have felt at that moment? Hmm? They tell him more of the story, so Peter goes along with them, along with some of his disciples. They end up at Caesarea, at the threshold of the military man's household. And Peter has just said he has never let unclean food across his lips. He has probably never stepped foot into the house of a Roman soldier. He steps across. And that step was a radical change in his life. I wonder what steps you may have taken. This church has taken radical steps in our history. In the 1960s, Dewey Pruitt, our pastor, marched with Dr. Martin Luther King. And the board wasn't pleased with it at the time. In the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, this congregation was a front runner in working for the full inclusion of women in leadership in the church. In the 90s, this church was a leader in the movement to fully recognize and include LGBTQIA persons in the life of this congregation. Right now, this congregation is working extremely hard on what it means to undo the racial shackles of white supremacy in our midst. We have often stepped over the threshold into change. Well, Peter steps across the threshold into change, and he tells the story of Jesus to the Roman centurion and his family, and immediately something dramatic happens. The Holy Spirit falls on all of them, and Peter is aghast. What is he to do? He baptizes all of them in the name of Jesus. Back at the Jerusalem church, he tells this story, and at the end of it, the story tells us that the authorities were silent. And then they praised God, saying, then God must love the Romans too and wants them to flourish. We don't see this story as radical as it was. It's interesting to me that chapter 11 retells the same story that was told in chapter 10. Why? It's a second witness. It's that important. It's quite a change of mind. That board could have become rigid, protective of the tradition, the customs, the rules. Maybe they did. We do know that the book of Acts is an idealized history. It's a story. We don't know that the event actually happened this way. We don't know that Peter actually went and preached the gospel to a Roman centurion. It's part of our tradition. It's designed to teach us. It's highly likely that if something like this actually happened in history, that the board wasn't thrilled with him. They were locked in their rigidity. It's equally possible that this story is designed by the writer to teach the church the way it ought to behave if they're to live out the gospel. This is what Christians ought to do if they live in the fullness of the Spirit. We read the story from the Bishop Carlton Pearson earlier or heard a quote from him. The Bishop, I first heard his story in 2005 in a podcast called This American Life with is it I, Ira, Glass. Ira Glass. What did I say last time? Eric, Ira Glass, and I was mesmerized by it. Pearson is a black Pentecostal pastor of a, was a megachurch in Tulsa. 
He was the heir apparent to Oral Roberts. Oral Roberts called him his black son. He wanted him to lead the Oral Roberts dynasty when he was gone. The problem is that Pearson had a vision in prayer. And God told him, there is no hell. That was his whole motivation for preaching every Sunday, to liberate people from the dangers of hell. It was the only reason for the church to train people, to liberate people from the hell fire that awaits them without Christ. What a radical change of mind. He started preaching the gospel of inclusion, that in Jesus Christ, everybody was already loved, everybody was already saved. How do you suppose the church responded? They weren't thrilled. Nine pastors, all of them left. If you saw one of them in the market, they turned and went the other way. He was a heretic. But he persevered. He's now a Unitarian Universalist minister, <laughs> writing books, preaching the gospel of inclusion. A radical change of mind. And he says, any time that knowledge and aversion of the truth are considered to be absolute, fundamentalism is the result. Whether the arena is Christianity, Islam, Judaism, or any other religious faith, as well as atheism, conservative, or liberal politics, I have met liberal, progressive people, atheists who are as dangerous and scary to me as any fundamentalist. Even evolution or intelligent design, people can get locked. Anytime our minds are closed, there is no room for dissent, and we are on the slippery slope towards stagnation. So how do we avoid it? Six quick things. First, remember the way the Spirit leads. Always toward greater openness, greater inclusion. Second, get out of your own shoes. If I stay in these size 10 and a half shoes all the time, I only know my own reality. What does it mean to enter somebody else's reality by getting in their shoes? Remember the way the Spirit leads. Get out of your own shoes. Pay attention to your resistance, third. Meaning, when you react, pay attention. What's coming up? What's getting activated? What can your resistance teach you about your adherence to your own tradition, your own customs, your own history? Fourth, stay curious. Curiosity is critical to flexibility. It unhooks us from rigidity. Fifth, question either or binary thinking. Either this or that. This is true, this is wrong. It was F. Scott Fitzgerald who once said, the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in the mind at the same time and still have the ability to function. And sixth, dare to cross a new threshold. That can take bravery. It means stepping out of the old and into the new. It's what the story of Peter teaches us. And the story tells us that the Romans were saved that day because Peter crossed the threshold. But I wonder if you see, as I do, that it wasn't just the Romans that got saved. It was Peter and his partners. It was the church of Jesus Christ that got saved. Liberated from their own cramped world of particular customs and traditions and rules and into the grand sweep of God's new humanity. And if they can get saved... We can too, and so can the world. Let us listen for what the Spirit may be whispering to each of us.
please join me in prayer. You are the potter, we are the clay. You are the shepherd guiding the way. You are the star that brightens our night, leading us home, leading us home. Some of us know what home feels like, and others do not quite know what home feels like. And as a congregation, we have weathered many changes throughout this pandemic that we are also figuring out what our home church is for us. And especially in this globalized world where we are encountering so many more people and places that are different from ourselves, now we are having to figure out what home may be for all of us. As we walk through this journey, this tumultuous journey that isn't very linear, we ask you, O God, to be the potter that shapes us, to be the shepherd that guides our way, to be the star that brightens our night, leading us home, leading us home. As the lyrics of this song that we just heard says, when we wander far, as close as our breath you are. Open our eyes and open our hearts and all of our senses to remember that you are so close. And just like Peter who was taking a nap and taken by surprise by this vision, this dream of you calling, the divine voice calling into something that was unknown and unimaginable, unsettling for his community. Will you also help us to listen and to be present when you call us by name? When we encounter you in unexpected situations, unwelcome and unsettling situations, will you help us to remember Peter, to remember your presence calling people young and old like Peter and Timothy, Mary, Miriam, Lydia, Anna, Simeon. Both long ago and today, you are still speaking to us, not because of our great accomplishments or our... um, anything that we might have to be prideful about, but because we are your people. So this week we pray that you would surprise us, that we would remember your presence as close to us as our breath and to journey with you into this unknown into this home that we are creating together. Today we especially pray with heavy hearts for the people who are suffering, for all of us who are so grieved by the white supremacist gun violence in Buffalo, New York that took 10 precious lives. Everyone else was also injured psychologically and emotionally and physically, we hold them in our hearts. And we also grieve the racially motivated targeted attacks at Asian businesses around North Texas and the familiarity of this trauma that Asian Americans have known for generations. Transform our grief, our fear, and our anger 
so that every little faltering step that we take might bring us closer to tending to these old and new wounds, cleaning up the messes and clearing the path for new life, new connection, new growth, and repair. Breathe on us your peace, O God. Shine on our path your light. Dream with us unimaginable directions, making borders more fluid, open, and hospitable. Awaken us from our slumber with renewed energy to be a church that meets the spiritual hunger of our time with creativity, intelligence, and imagination. Hold us when we are feeling helpless and despair or numb about all of the things that we hear that is going on in the world that make our hearts sink. And when we do not have the energy any longer to grieve or to feel, help us to remember the silence of those who were reawakened and whose eyes were opened to the things that you were doing in this world. And in the same way, may we fall into silence as we notice all of the things that you are doing amidst us, among us, within us. The things that we need to rejoice and dance for the things that we need to laugh and cherish. Remind us of those things to help us in this journey to fuel our passion and our desire to walk in line with your purposes. We pray. And at this time, I open up this prayer for our community to lift up anything that you might have of joy or a concern um, that you want to lift up. And I will say we pray to you, O God, for each prayer that you say, and we will respond with, hear our prayer. What shall we pray for today? I'd like uh, prayers for my daughter-in-law, Hetty, as well as my son, Ryan, and the kids, Astrid and Seth. Hetty has a vascular malformation in her brain about the size of a golf ball, and it's too risky to do surgery. Mm. So, yeah, prayers. <laughs> yeah, we pray to you, God. Hear our prayer. Anyone else? A prayer of thanksgiving for the safe return of our daughter and grandson from uh, Poland, where they were working with Ukrainian refugees. Mm -hmm. Praise, praise God! Thank yeah, you. giving thanks with you. We pray to you, oh God. Your prayer. Any other joys, concerns? What shall we pray for today? So from Jane Gentry, she also prays for the families in New York City. And she prays that her daughter and son-in-law who were just uh, transferred by the military are able to buy a house quickly in Atlanta. Mm. Um, Cameron Gibbs wrote this prayer. Creator of all of us, awaken us to the opportunistic nature of tyranny and its use of our differences to scare us that it objectifies the other using those attitudes to justify removing them from any form of power. Help us to see and stand up for all who are God's children, regardless of our differences. Teach us your love of diversity. 
And then from Phil, prayers for Lorraine Chavez, healing of memory loss, hearing loss, health problems, restored excellence in health, in Jesus' name, and also that her possessions and finances will be restored in Jesus. And that's it. So with our online community, we pray to you, O God, your prayer. Mehdi. I'm praying for Abby, who was deciding to go to help in Ukraine to help from Davis. And last month he was talking to me to go. And since that, we didn't hear from him. And uh, we are messaging, he's not answering. Mm -hmm. So I'm praying for Abi. He was deciding to go help Mm -hmm. from Davis to Ukraine. Okay, we pray for Abi. Abi, Abi, yeah. We pray to you, God. Hear our prayer. All right. Gathering all these prayers in the love of God, let us now pray a prayer that is similar to the one that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Ground of all being, Mother of life, Father of the universe, your name is beyond speaking. May we know your presence. May your longings be our longings in heart and in action. May there be food for the human family today and for the whole earth community. Forgive us the falseness of what we have done as we forgive those who are untrue to us. Do not forsake us in our time of conflict, but lead us into new beginnings. For the light of life, the vitality of life, and the glory of life are yours now and forever. Amen. Good morning. I'm Mike Coleman. I'm with the Financial Support Ministry. Next month, DCC's session will adopt the budget for the coming year. Yeah, that's right. It's not New Year's Day, but it's July 1st coming up. That's the start of our fiscal year, and we decide to do our budget uh, planning on a fiscal year basis. It sort of lines up better with the schools and and other employers around here. And, you know, actually for me, I don't know about some of you, but for me it lines up better with my environmental poetic sensibilities, actually, because we begin our budget preparation and planning in the winter and then move into visioning and finalizing it as spring emerges. Maybe budgeting isn't the first thing that comes to mind when you think of spring awakening. (laughs) Um, But think about that budgeting, uh, what comes to mind, line items, numbers, money, limits, constraints. But the budget really done well, budgeting is so much more, it's planning. And so in February, in the winter, right, our ministries began uh, thinking about the foundation of our budgeting, which is not to do with money and light items and dollars, but to do with grounding. What are our purposes What do we envision for the coming year? What things do we want to let go of? What things do we want to, um, to, uh, what things are emerging for us as a congregation that we need to plan for in the coming year? So all of our wonderful ministries, worship, buildings and grounds, community life, youth ministry, children's ministry, compassion, peace and justice, community life, new expressions, all the wonderful things this community does. And then, uh, of course, things never go as planned in budgeting, right? Things never go as planned. But this planning that we do, of course, helps to provide some stability, some firmer expectation, so that when things do inevitably uh, emerge that we haven't planned for, we can handle them more gracefully. And they're the exception rather than the rule. So we start our budget planning without those numbers and light items and constraints. We start with visioning, imagination, collaboration, transparency. And then we look at the resources that we need 
to be able to carry that out. And that's where you all come in right now on our current pledge season. Very important because pledging is our way of helping us understand what we can expect in the coming year. Your pledges help us get an idea of what we can expect to come in, those resources. Very helpful and very important for us carrying out this financial planning, right? And what we can do. It's really critical for stewardship, for uh, being responsible stewards to those that vision that we've uh, laid out, articulated for what we're going to do so that we can live up to the commitments that we're making to our wonderful staff, to this wonderful church campus, and to our community. So if you haven't already pledged, please do so today. <laughs> we need to get those in. And um, this is such a wonderful act of generosity. It comes from a feeling of gratitude. I can tell you, this act in itself can bring you closer in spirit to this beloved community that we all share. Thank you. Inspired by the testimony of Janice and Alex Cook, may we each find our own way to contribute to the mission and ministry of our community. Let us give gladly and generously so that we may become a house of prayer for all people a people of boundless compassion, a place that contributes to the common good, and a community of resistance to any power that does not pursue peace, liberty, and justice for all. Those of us here at DCC today may leave our gifts in the designated stations as you leave. Those of us participating online can give by mail, through our website, or through your bank or credit union's bill paying feature. If you need help knowing how to do so, please email our Minister of Finance at finance at dccprez.org. This is a time when we pass the peace with one another, which is an ancient ritual that encourages us to be like Christ, to be a presence of peace. If you're online, you may pass the peace by saying, peace of Christ be with you. You can share the peace with someone next to you, to yourself, or think of someone that you'd like to send peace. For those who are physically here, we will pass a touch-free peace with one another even while we stand and greet each other. We invite you to turn to the people around you and say, peace be with you. So we've got announcements, and we're already running over, and we've got long announcements. So can you bear with us? Those of you who are online can just turn, it, turn us off, but those of you who are here, you'd have to stomp out. So I hope you'll stay put. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. <laughs> so today at 4 o'clock, I hope you'll return. Our choir concert takes place, or our, our music concert takes place this afternoon at 4 o'clock. All of our music ministries will be presenting both sacred and secular music. It'll be a delight, and I hope that you'll return for that this afternoon. Jim Goss, our resident theologian, will be offering his class on Jesus from the Gospel of Mark and John, 2 o'clock today in the Fireside Room or Hybrid online. You can find the link in your Friday e-news. There are two opportunities for um, practicing the gospel of inclusion that we have heard today. One is um, a conference that is happening on June 4th at Westminster Presbyterian Church. It is a time of prayer, uh, prayers and reflection about our calling to be people of radical hospitality to LGBTQIA plus folks and others who have been historically marginalized. So um, see the details in the e-news and register in advance for this conference at, on June 4th. There's another opportunity on June 12th, um, which will be Pride Sunday, and DCC is going to have an exhibit at the Pride booth in the 
farmer's market, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we would welcome your participation. It's going to be a lot of fun, a, a raffle and the spin, spin the wheel thing, and we're gonna make this a time of partying and fun. And so um, if you would like to sign up to participate for, uh, to, like, to be at the booth and to welcome people, we would really appreciate that. And so you can be in touch with me um, if you'd like to help. Uh, or if you'd like to donate a prize for the raffle or, this, or spin the wheel. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, Bob, why don't you come and tell us a little bit about what's happening with the emergency response team. So Bob has a public safety announcement. We'll have a series of these over the next month, just helping you understand what we're doing locally to keep people safe when they come to worship at DCC. Yeah, so the emergency response team was basically developed to help plan on treating... Uh, any emergencies that we might have at DCC. And medical emergency was probably one, one of the stronger points, components that we felt we needed to deal with. And so by having the DCC staff, uh, ushers, and even members of DCC uh, take first aid, CPR, and AED class and be certified that we felt comfortable that we could handle most medical situations. As a matter of fact, the first year that we had um, the emergency response team, we had three medical situations where most of them were where somebody had slipped or fallen, but we did have one cardiac arrest where uh, a member of our congregation gave CPR and actually got the heartbeat back again, which normally does not happen with CPR. Uh, we also have, that was a time that we figured that we needed an AED. And an AED is, is a automated external defibrillator. And by hooking up this device to a person, it will analyze the heartbeat or absent of a heartbeat. And it has the, the capabilities of de delivering an electronic shock to reestablish a heartbeat. So we ended up getting two AEDs for, for DCC. And it came to start talking to one another and said, well, how many people in the congregation actually know where the AEDs are even located? So we felt that that was important to let you know. So we have one here in the sanctuary. If you go into the narthex and you look over on the west wall, there's a door that's curtained, and above it, it will say AED. So if you go into that storage room on the right-hand wall, there's a met white metal cabinet that the, D, uh, a, that the uh, AED, thank you, is located. And so you, you'd want to take that out and bring it back. The other AED is located in Fellowship Hall. So if you're looking at the kitchen, the right-hand door going into the kitchen, the wall right there, has a white metal cabinet where your AED is also located. Uh, one warning, when you do open the door to get the AED out, a high pitch uh, will sound off just to let people know that, some, hey, somebody's getting the AED. So you'll want to get the AED out quickly and close the door so you save your ears. So that was a strong point that, that we felt having an AED here on campus. The other thing that we would like to do is continue with our offering uh, a course in CPR and AED usage. So uh, at the end of the service, uh, in the narthex, we'll add the table. If you want to come over and interested in taking class, you can sign up for the class and we'll organize uh, a future class where people can be certified. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. So 50 people in our church have been trained. You can be trained, which is helpful not only here but elsewhere. The AD, AED, Bob, I sometimes need help from the congregation knowing what to say. So the AED is located in that little cubby hole. Note it when you leave today. Would you do that so you know where it is? You could help save a life. So thank you, Bob. You can come over and we'll show you. And they'll show, or sign up for a class. Two fun things this week. Right outside today is... Uh, Anthony Palmier with our Trishaw. Where's he out front? 
He's out front. With the, you'll see it when you leave. The Trishaw is a vehicle we helped purchase locally to help get people around who need rides. You might see it today or even take a ride with Anthony. And then second, Holy Happy Hour, 5 to 7, this Thursday on the North Lawn. Come and just reassemble with people, beer, wine, soft drinks, snacks, and games. We hope that you'll come and enjoy that. Now, please rise and body your spirit for our final song. We'll sing how many verses? Two verses of this song. May you find 10,000 reasons this week to cross some threshold, breaking over some barrier, fostering a new and holy inclusion in this world that is an eruption of divine love in your life and in the life of the world. Go in grace and peace. Amen. Amen.